Troops, here we are. It's another Eagle podcast. It's another day in the lockdown. So I've set myself a task to find yet another awesome guest. And I've been joined by a top cyclist, a man who's had a hard ride, to say no least. It's Josh Quigley. Josh, thanks very much for coming on the show. How are you doing, sir? Thanks for having me. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, from the view I've got, it looks like the sun is out in Scotland. Now that is rare as it gets. <laughs> 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 yeah it's a very beautiful day today it's really nice um for those who don't know uh josh to say that you're a keen cyclist might be a bit of an understatement um let's talk all things cycling go for it tell us about your team and, and who you ride for and why you ride yeah so i'm not actually part of a team yet That's right that's my big goal at the moment for, for this year, really, is to get signed by a team. I'm hoping to be be a pro cyclist for the next season. Nice. Most, most of my cycling in, in the last few years has just been mainly solo, ultra-endurance stuff. Yeah. Cycling around the world has been my big thing and my big goal and my big mission for the last few years. And that was really... It was something I got into later in life. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't a sort of a team yeah. prodigy or you know, a teenage athlete or anything like that. The complete opposite, actually. It was really just a few years ago in 2015. Yeah. I was, just to be brutally honest, I was going through a really dark period in my life. I was, yeah. you know, I was drinking a lot. I was taking a lot of drugs. And I just thought, you know, I just, I just can't do this anymore. This is, I need to, I need to change and I need to do something different. And I was inspired to get into cycling by Sir Chris Hoy. Is this and, roughly around about the Olympics time? This was 2000 and the end of 2015, so just just about six months before the Olympics. Yeah, probably. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was. I'm I'm just sort of trying to. What what was the trigger with, with the drugs and the alcohol? Like, what was the trigger to make you say, it's it's got to stop? Were you associating with like the wrong type of people, or what would you say was the moment where you thought it, something needs to change? It was it was a suicide attempt actually, and. 2015, I'd, wow. you know, I'd, I'd, went, I'd went through a breakup at the end of 2014 and, you know, found that quite difficult, me and my yeah. girlfriend together for a long time and, yeah. you know, it's not, I don't say that so people feel sorry for me. And think, no, no, know, no. I, I say that because largely it was actually my fault, you know, I was, I wasn't a great boyfriend, I was a sort of, you know, a typical British lad interested <laughs> in going to the pub, drink, mm. drugs, weekend, you know, that sort of lifestyle and, you know. I made a lot of mistakes and I paid the price for it and, you know, we broke up and then, but I just found it really difficult. It was, you know, seven or eight years of my life was just over in a flash and I just really just didn't know how to deal with it. And I was, you know, I was so depressed and I was in yeah. so much pain and, you know, I was, I was, I was always the guy who do drunk and done drugs anyway, but right. I, was, I was doing it a lot more. I was doing it, you know, a lot more than I usually would. And it wasn't a social thing. It was more just a get over thing. Yeah, I was just trying to deal with how I was feeling and that obviously led to me in 2015, about six months ago going through that and I thought, you know what, fuck this, I cannot do this anymore. Like, I just woke up one night and thought I'm going to do it and I went out and I crashed my car at like 70 mile an hour in the motorway. Fuck and I, I was really lucky to survive that and, you know, it was that was that was the real turning point, I guess, where I remember just being in the hospital that night after it and just feeling like something's got to change. It's, you know... I, I can't keep living my life this way anymore. It was, you know, it was just, I was a problem oh. and I had to change. So that that was a real turning point for me. Well, that's powerful, mate. Um, you know, thanks very much for sharing that with us. That's, uh, uh, that's a very, very, very deep and very dark um, territory that we've, that we've gone into there. And uh, um, it's kind of stumped me a little bit. Like, I, obviously I read your bio um, before we started the podcast, but um when you hear it like that, you know what I mean? When, when you read something and then when you hear it and you attach the two things together, it, it sort of knits it all together. So, um, so Chris Hoy was your inspiration. Um, yeah. What particularly about cycling drew you and, and what's the, where does the love come from from cycling? It's it's really interesting. My journey to my, my, my journey yeah. to cycling has been so fascinating because <laughs> Something that I would not have, I only really realized this in the last couple of years is that, you know, cycling was actually probably my first love in life. Like when I was, yeah. you know, when I was three, three, four, five years old, I was 
you know, I was crazy about bikes and I was cycling all the time. And then like a lot of young guys at that age, you, you just, because of football has been such a big thing in the UK and actually started playing football. And then from the age of like five until, you know, 15, football was my life. Like I absolutely loved it. I was, you know, I never left the house without a football. And it just, I just almost sort of forgot about cycling just because I love football that much. And I think, I think a big part of that was obviously my dad. He was a, a massive Rangers fan. And so I was a big Rangers fan. Yeah. You know, Rangers was a big part of my life growing up. I was a massive fan. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting how I started off with cycling and then kind of, I just forgot about it for all those years. And then it was, it was going along to an event in Edinburgh where Sir Chris Hoy was speaking. And I, I don't know why, I was just so inspired by his talk. And mm. he, was ta he was talking about when he won his first gold medal, I think it was in Athens, 2004. And he basically won it by like one thousandth of a second. And it was just, it was just such an incredible story. And the, he showed the video of it on the screen. And I just, I just felt like I was watching it live. And I remember that day I was just sitting in the audience and I thought, fuck it, I'm going to cycle around the world. That was, that was literally, that was what happened. And at that time I was about 14 stone. I was quite overweight. I was really out of shape. I was, you know, drinking and doing drugs four times a week. Mm. Diet was terrible. I mean, I was in, as far away as possible from a guy who could cycle around the world. But I just, I knew I had to do something different. I knew I had to get out of Scotland because it was just, the, the environment I was in, I was just, it was impossible to stop drinking. I thought I need to get away. So I was, I was wanting to go away and travel and go away anyway. So cycling around the world just came into my life at the perfect time. It was like okay. the perfect goal. It was a perfect solution. It was just, it was just absolutely perfect for me. So you just bought a bike and said, right, left or right, and I'm off. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. I, I came up with the idea you for it. it. You know, I, I kind of, I launched, I launched it online. I told people about it managed to get sponsors on board, partners, got a bike, all the equipment. And it was about yeah. six months after that, in the May of 2016, wow. that I set off to cycle around the world. And how, I mean, that is proper, like, maverick sort of, like, you know what I mean? Like, that's a big, you know, that would be a big challenge for, like, a, you know, someone like a big organisation to, to, to sort of bring together and, and organise, like, a guy, a guy, a guy from from Scotland. How, how did you sort of, you know, how did you bring it together, or was it just a case of like, I'll sort that, I'll sort tomorrow out to, you know what I mean, like tomorrow? There was there was really no plan at all. It was, <laughs> there, was there was there was there wasn't a plan. It was just I was just best, the best way to describe it is that you know I was just I was really in a dark place. I was so yeah. depressed. I was so unhappy. And I was basically just pedaling towards happiness. That's that's the way I put it in my mind. It was it was a journey to happiness for me. I didn't I didn't care where I went, I didn't care about what countries, I didn't care how far I cycled. I just honestly it was so it's such a uh, it's so weird for me because on the one hand I love Scotland so much and I'm yeah. so passionate about Scotland, but at that time in my life I hated Scotland. You know, I, I was I blamed Scotland for all my problems. I thought I just need to get away from Scotland just to sort myself out. And so I, I left Scotland on the 26th of May, 2016, and there was no plan other than just get the hell out of this country and go get as far away as I can. So I was just, naturally, I just headed south through England and then went, got the boat across to France and started cycling through Europe. Jesus Christ. How long did it take you? Um, first of all, like, let's thank, you know, the people who, who are your sponsors and that and, and, and your bike, like, what did you, how much did you know about bikes and sort of how to repair bikes and like? Nothing, no, no, no nothing. I, I knew, wow. I, I literally knew nothing about fixing bikes or mechanics, anything like that. Like I was such a, I, I couldn't even stress just how much of a, of a rookie I was. And, and to be quite honest, just how underprepared I was for what I was about to attempt. But, you know, I think that the thing that got me through it and I never actually, finished the challenge the first time but the thing that like I, I went away for basically for a year cycled about 10,000 miles through 14 countries and the wow. thing that was really propelling me and driving me was just just pure pain like I was just mm -hmm. I was just in pain that's the best way to put it and you know pain's one of the greatest drivers 100%. for anything if you've if you've been through pain of your experience in pain and you want to feel better well that's just, it's just rocket fuel. And people have, I've done like quite a few interviews and stuff about this. And people have yeah. always said like, you know, 
how how did you do it? Like how did you how did you actually go and do that? And the best way to put it is that you know that the pain of just being me and having my life in Scotland was far greater than the pain of cycling. Oh, and it's not to say that the cycling was easy. It was it was so hard, but it was it was the it was the least painful option for me at that time. So you're on your bike. Yeah, yeah. What did you have like a certain? I'll do thirty mile, forty mile, fifty mile a day. Like, was there a certain mileage that you wanted to complete, or were you trying to get about, to a certain? I checkpoint? started off. Started off doing fifty miles a day. That was my that was my target. Fifty miles, which, as as I'm sure we'll get to later in this conversation, fifty miles for me now is not even a warm up. It's yeah, really not. Well. But back back then in 2016, like those fifty miles was like climbing Everest every single wow. day. Like it, it really, you know, it was. Literally, it was the it was the hardest thing ever, and you know, I, I totally underestimated the challenge. I thought, yeah, I, I thought to myself, look, I know how to ride a bike. How hard can it be? That was that was my that was my mindset. But those those early early beginning weeks of cycling around the world, it was you know it was just so tough. But the best thing about it was after maybe two or three weeks, wasn't that fast. Sorry, it wasn't that long. I started to get really fit and I started to enjoy the cycling and, you know, I just kept on moving forward. Yeah, it's that, that, that's a great point. Obviously, your bike must have been laden with supplies and, and a camping system and a tent. So, obviously, you want, you know, you want going for speed while you, you, you want, you know, you want carrying as minimum as possible going for aerodynamics and, and all that sort of good stuff. But I was just going to ask you, actually, like, your, your body must have absolutely went through hell from being mega unfit to like the transformation where your body just said, this is now the new norm and the body can quickly adapt, can't it? To like, right, we need to get rid of any excess sort of fat. We, you know, your, your VO2, your lungs must have just went, right, okay, we, we're now doing this. And could you physically feel yourself almost getting fitter and thinner and, and stronger every day on the bike? I think for, for the first two weeks, like the first seven to 14 days, it was just... It was just pure pain. Like there was never any, yeah. there was never any feeling like this is never going to get better. But I just, I just kept moving forward. There was no other option. I just had to keep going. And then I think it was probably after about two weeks where I thought, oh, you know what? I'm actually starting to feel a little bit fit now. And just, I was gradually getting fitter and faster and getting better. But when, when I first started it, it was never about going fast. It was never about yeah. speed. It was never about distance. It was never about, to be honest, it was never about the bike in the beginning. It was yeah, nothing, yeah. The bike was just a vehicle. For me, it was like a. It was really just the vehicle for for the journey that I was on. God, it's it, it's interesting and and sort of once you left the UK and you got onto sort of into mainland Europe, what what challenges did that sort of bring up? Are you fluent in any other language or what? No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I was I was I was quite lucky. I was in you know I was in the north of Europe. You know mm. France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Sweden. Norway. These are countries that are very, yeah. you know, there's a lot of English speaking people there. So I was quite lucky in that regard. I think it's interesting when you ask what were the challenges that I was facing in those early days. It, it was it's such a it's so fascinating to, to reminisce in that period in my mm. life because it was such an adventure in a sense of when I think back and I think, you know, there wasn't any challenges. I'm I'm sure there was, but when I when I think back and I just think back and it's like I've got so much nostalgia. Mm. And I think that if you think about it, like I literally was a guy who was like depressed, suicidal, mm. overweight, out of shape. And then just literally in the space of a couple of weeks, I went from that life, you know, being in Scotland, being hung over, you know, mm. drinking all the time. I went from that to like a few weeks later, being cycling through, you know, Holland and Denmark and just feeling amazing and having just such an adventure. And it was just, it was just life changing. It was it was so life changing for me, and it was just that that those early periods. Although the cycling was tough, mm. I was just getting so much from it. Like it was just it was fulfilling me in so many different ways that it almost feels like there was no challenges in the beginning because I was just there was so much upside. Did you record it in any way? Did you make any sort of video blogs, or did you have like a uh, some sort of you know a Garmin or a Suntour watch which sort of tracked your daily activity or your calorie? calories in calories out sort of log i was i was documenting a lot of it you know like i was doing like i was daily daily blogs and videos mm. and social media content and diaries and journals but quite interestingly i was 
I was not recording any of the physical side of it. Like I, yeah. I wasn't tracking. I didn't use Strava or anything like that. Yeah. I didn't, at the end of each day, I didn't know how many miles I'd done. I only used, I used to know because I had a rough idea because I knew which town I started and I knew where I stopped. But I never actually tracked it. Wow. And that's just, when I think it's even just weird for me saying that now, given that, you know, like when I go out and I ride now, it's like so, <laughs> it's so focused on the numbers and the data that it's just, it's funny to me that I, I cycled so much in the past without even tracking any of it. Just on that, obviously, you're coming at this from like an athlete point of view and data is very important. But starting slightly away from what we're talking about, do you feel like we're getting away from it all a bit? You know, Strava's great, but I literally know people who say, if it's not on Strava, it didn't happen. And it's like, you can still go out for a cycle or a run or a hike and you don't have to record every single thing you do. You can just enjoy the moment. What, what, what's your take on it? It totally depends on the individual because, for example, I, I know of so many, for example, when I was on my last challenge last year, cycling around the world, mm. I met a couple of other British cyclists when I was in, you know, I was in Turkey and we were going across wow. Asia together. And I spent a couple of days with them because I was, I, was, I was ill and I was coming back from the illness and I wasn't going that fast and they were going a lot slower than me. And th those were two guys who were the complete opposite of me and, you know, they weren't really tracking what they were doing or they, they yeah. may, maybe were, but they didn't really care about the numbers. They were just, yeah. to them, it was a trip. It was a holiday. It was an adventure. Whereas I'm the opposite in the sense of, you know, when you say that thing about, you know, should you maybe just do it be more in the moment, enjoy it more, I actually get more happiness and enjoyment from the numbers well. than, I, than I would from the opposite, if that makes sense. Mm. Like out with the actual cycling, like the actual task of riding the bike, the thing that I love the most and that makes me really happy is the numbers. Like I, I love the data. I'm so obsessed by the data because for me now, like I'm, I'm not an adventurer. I'm not an explorer. I'm, I'm cycling for performance. Yeah, yeah. I'm, working, I'm working towards really specific targeted goals. So the numbers are just so important because they just tell you so much. And mm. I, I love nothing more than, you know, going out for a session and then coming home and then sitting for hours pouring over the data and analyzing it and comparing it. So it just depends on who you are. I, I know people who would hate to track everything, but I also know people like myself who would hate to not track everything. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm fascinated by, by wearable technology because I got into doing long distance hiking because someone bought me a Fitbit and I got obsessed with counting steps. So like I, I've been down that rabbit hole of like, oh, numbers, 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 calories in, calories out miles covered and then obviously it's like oh well if i bought that one it tracks this and it tracks that and then you so like i'm i get it I, i'm not really there now but I, I have been there in the past um what what are you using like what are you sponsored by anyone in particular have you got a favorite brand so i'm i'm tracking so much at the moment I'm, <laughs> the, the, the number one thing that I'm, I'm doing at the moment is i use a software called training peaks Right. Which is really, I've so I now I now have a coach on board. Um, there's a company called Espresso Cycle Coaching. They're now my coach. And right. They cool. Coach me. So, we when I go out in a session, you know, I've got a, a Wahoo bike computer. Which Wahoo is one of my favorite brands. I'm yeah. I'm not sponsored by them. I just I just love their products. And so I, I track everything on that. I've got the heart rate monitor, and then I upload all that to to the Training Peak software, and that. Wow. That's just such an amazing tool. Like it, you know, it can tell you like how fit I am, where my form is, how fatigued I am. And we really just by using that data, we we, we plan my entire training around that. And it, you know, it tells. So it's it's really fascinating. So it's uh, I'm absolutely loving that at the moment. Yeah, it's, it, that's an interesting um, side of it. Um, I've had the pleasure of speaking to some um, really great uh, runners and sort of delved into mindset uh where one was one was very very sort of like all about the mindset and you know it's all right having a great coach running coach or a great dietitian or a nutrition or whatever but the mind josh fascinates me because there's people out there who who may be fitter physically but when it comes down to it the mind is ultimately, I think, what separates the winners and the losers. Um, do you, how do you train the mind? Obviously, you've had 
you know, quite an arduous upbringing, so you will have a, a robust character about you anyway. But is there anything else that you do? Do you have a, you know, a, a coach in that regards? Not really. I think for, for me, the the greatest thing that I've done for my mind is, is it's not something I've actively done. It's probably just adversity. Like I think adversity yep. and pain and obstacles yep. and, I just, I just feel like I've, I've been through so much adversity. I've been through so many obstacles. I've, I've experienced so much pain in different ways. And I just yeah. think that there's nothing greater than, than those things. The things that really push you and test you mm. are, are the greatest things. Because once you, once you come through those things, you just yeah. like, for example, I've, I went through a really serious crash in America at the end of last year. Yeah. Yeah. And here I am less than three months later, back in the bike out there, you know, fit and fit and healthy again, and you know, just just to have the knowledge, like I now have the knowledge that I can have, I can get hit by a car at seventy mile an hour, and three months later be back in the bike. Now that's that tells me how mentally strong I am. Yeah, because a lot of people, like I don't think people would have, I actually think people would have respected me if after that I said, you know what, I'm actually going to call it a day now because you know. Yeah, yeah. It's like I've just been hit by a car at 70 mile an hour. You know, I'm actually just going to kind of give up cycling now because it's too risky. And, you know, I just, I want to spend time with my family, whatever, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I think people would have said, fair enough, Josh. You know, you've been yeah. through a lot on the bike. But yeah. the fact that I'd done the opposite, which was, you know, the, the only thing I was thinking about when I was in hospital for five weeks was getting back in the bike. And I, I'm very proud of the fact that there was never one moment in five weeks of being in hospital or whatever, like I never once questioned, will I get back in the bike? Mm. It was just, it was an automatic default, set in stone, cast iron. I'm getting back in the bike no matter what. Wow. And I'm going to finish this challenge. And I think that for me to come through that and to be on the other side of that, just, just proves to me, one, how mentally strong I've become. Yeah. And two, just how much I love cycling. Yeah, I mean, we've touched on loads there. I'm, I'm just trying to sort of um, use some of that that you've talked about there. I think, I think with, a, with a traumatic event, it is very, very easy to, to sort of say, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. But, you know, if, if you want to be serious, you've got to almost go and get straight back on the horse, excuse the pun. You've got to get, you know, and you've got to get up to, when you had your crash, were you were you at speed as well, or were you hit at speed? You know, what was the what sort of crash were you? What how was the crash? I was so I was in Texas in America, and I was riding on a, a road late at night about ten p.m. Mm -hmm. and I was I must have been I wasn't going that fast. You know, I'd been on the bike for like thirteen hours that day. I must have right. been doing maybe you know sixteen, seventeen miles an hour, something like that. Right. Okay. On a touring bike, and I, I was hit from behind by a Cadillac car that was traveling 70 miles an hour so then that hit me I flew 50 feet through the air hit the ground and then was taken to hel taken to hospital on a helicopter so that was Fucking yeah hell. I mean yeah I mean that's that's crazy I mean a Cadillac is a big old fuck, that's like what like a two-ton sort of vehicle isn't it like it's a big old lump traveling at 70 yeah, I mean that's a big car and you you think about a human being on a bike, you know, there's there's no real safety or protection there. No. Like, you think about anybody being hit at seventy mile an hour by a car. That's that's yeah. very high impact. Huge. And did he? <laughs> God, I feel like you're a cat. You've had uh, you've had a, used a few of these lives, haven't you? Do you know what I mean? You've had a few. You've definitely had a bit of a bit of a, a strong upbringing there. Um, Outside of cycling, so surviving <laughs> seventy mile an hour crashes is my my thing. I'm, that's what I'm really talented. <laughs> Yeah, man, that's uh, wow. And what what sort of injuries did you sustain? I mean, obviously, uh, were you wearing a helmet? Were you wearing a helmet? Yeah, I was. If I wasn't wearing a helmet, I don't think I'd be having this conversation yeah. right now. So I was. I had a I had a fractured skull. I had damage to one of the arteries in my neck. Wow. Seven broken ribs. I had a fracture in one of the bones in my back. I had. A uh, fractured ankle, a fractured heel, a fractured shin. Jesus Christ! Uh, two, two major surgeries. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty intense. But it it shows me like 
just like you know sometimes people they think the human body is this like weak timid like oh you know oh i've got to be so so careful realistically what the human body is is it's the most robust piece of kit that's ever been issued do you know what i mean and like when you train both mind and body like it, it can almost become an unstoppable i mean think about achievements that we've achieved as human beings we've broken records we've been to the moon we've been at the bottom of the oceans like these are the things we can do when we stop living in like this little oh i best not do this and like covid19 is very very serious at the moment don't get me wrong but there is some people really struggling and there's some people really thriving now regardless of what the threat was um the people who thrive would always thrive like you do you know what i mean like you're not staying in your house because of COVID-19. You'd be out on that bike every day, getting fitter, getting stronger, because you've been through so much that actually it's just, it's just another day in the Josh house. Do you know what I mean? Um, and these are all things which have you've like added to your um, armory. I call them um, putting calluses on the mind. Um, David Goggin uses that phrase of like, just another callus on the mind of, of, of toughness. And it's, it, it, it's interesting. And it, I mean, a fractured skull, I mean, obviously your helmet obviously took all the, all the force there and God, it's, uh, it's unbelievable that you've, you've been through that sort of trauma. Could, could you remember the moment or was it just like lights out gone? No, I, no the first thing I can remember is just being on the ground and someone being beside me and speaking to me, I just, I just knew something wasn't right. Yeah, yeah. And I was, I was a bit out of it, and then I can remember the helicopter arriving and going in the helicopter, and then arriving at the hospital. But not, not the, act, the, the good thing about being in such a traumatic incident is that you don't really feel it. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. When you, when you, when you say getting hit by a car seventy miles an hour, it sounds so like bad, True. but yeah, you don't feel it. You don't. Yeah. It, it happens so fast that you know when, when you're in hospital with seven broken ribs you will feel that for sure but yeah yeah at, at the time you don't feel it and would you say you're back to 100 percent recovery no nah, not not yet i would say no. you know my i'm still nowhere near 100 percent, but I'm, I'm at a level where like I'm, I'm good enough to i can go out and cycle it doesn't cause me any problems you know i'm i'm just building i had seven weeks out injured so i'm I'm just still building back my fitness. You know, I lost a lot of form and conditioning. So I'm nowhere near my best yet, but I'm, I'm able to go out and train every day. So that's the only thing that matters right now. As long as I can train, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. And what's, obviously COVID-19 has put a stop to everything, but what's on the, what's on the, on the uh, race, race card for you? Like what would be, a, what would be um, an all-time goal? Like someone like the Tour de France, something like that? So, so basically, my, my plans and goals were, in, in an ideal world, my plan was to finish cycling around the world. And mm -hmm. I originally was planning to do that in December, but then I was, I was always hitting America just before that. So after that happened, my plan was to you know, recover from my injuries and then go back to America and finish the cycle in April this year. Yeah. And then after that, I was then going to start racing. And, you know, just, I was going to, the last few years, I've mainly just been cycling around the world, ultra endurance, but I was going to be changing to road racing. And, you know, my big goal was, you know, the Tour de France. I want to, yeah. that's my, for the next five years, that's my ultimate mission. I want to be the first ever Scottish winner of the Tour de France. That's my, my big dream and mission. And that's what I'm going to do. And so that's, that's what I would, that was my plan for after cycling around the world. But obviously now things have changed a little bit with the coronavirus situation. So yeah. right now I've, I'm just continuing to train and just continuing to keep building my fitness. I need to get back to America at some point to finish the cycle. Yeah. You know, I was hoping to get that done in April, but that's, we, we just don't know when that's going to be. So for now, the, the plan is that, you know, I've got a coach on board now, as I mentioned, and yeah. we're, we're getting, I'm, the race, the training that I'm doing is geared towards road racing. Right. It's, it's not for, it's not for cycling around the world. I'm training for racing now because there might be a situation where I actually race before I finish cycling around the world, which, because, you know, one of the last things to, to go back to normal might be international travel. Because, yeah, 100%. You know, if, if, if America gets a handle on their, on their own coronavirus situation, you know, they might be, you know, wary of, 
letting people from other countries come and they might bring it. So yeah, yeah. There, might, there might be a situation where, you know, I don't even see the point speculating. We, we just don't know. Yeah. The, the, main, the main point is that I'm, I'm training as if there's going to be a race tomorrow, basically. I'm just, I'm keeping myself in tip-top shape and when the time comes, I will be ready. Yeah, I think it's a great, that's a great mindset because I feel like a lot of people will be caught cold because they'll be thinking, oh, well, I'll wait until someone tells me something uh, and then I'll go where you're going to be like, it's, t- it's tomorrow. And you'll be like, right, see you tomorrow. I'm, 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 I'm there. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's definitely a, it's the winner's mindset. Yeah, this is, this is a massive, obviously, coronavirus is obviously a horrible thing, right? And I, mm. I don't wish, I, I wish we weren't going through it, but the facts are that we are. We are where happened. we are. And so now I think every individual has to ask themselves, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to respond to this? That's my, that's like one of my philosophies for life is that how you respond to the events in your life is going to determine your life. And for me, coronavirus is, is becoming an opportunity for me personally, because there's a lot of people within pro cycling right now. A lot of the guys at the top who they're, they're really, they're taking their eye off the ball. They're, they're struggling for motivation because they don't know when the races are going to yeah, be yeah. either. You know, they've stopped, they've stopped training that, you know, started eating, junk food again yeah and this, yeah and what i was so this this for me is a massive opportunity because i'm i'm not slacking off in any way i'm i'm the opposite i'm actually training harder than i've ever trained because wow i know this is an amazing opportunity for me to to you know close the gap on the guys that are at the very top that i want to beat one day so i'm i'm, I'm making the most of this and when the time comes i'll, I'll be ready I tell you what, man, you're a great advertisement for yourself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting fucking fired up listening to you. I, I love it. Like, I love, there's too much of this, um, I feel sorry for myself culture going about, and, and I, I absolutely hate it. Um, set a goal, uh, and at the level you want to achieve it at, go and, go and achieve it. Don't, don't wait for anyone to do you a favour, because it ain't going to come. Do you know what I mean? Um, what sort of, sort of interests me as well, for you, for the cycling um, side of it, where do you ever just get the bike out and sort of do you do um, peloton? I know peloton's doing really well at the moment. Um, sort of spinning is 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 on on the rise again. Do you ever do stuff like that, or do you always out in the in the sunshine or no, the rain? No, I'm I'm personally not a fan of the indoor stuff. You right, know, I under, understand why people like it. I understand its appeal, but. For me, I just yeah, love, being the, I, I love being out in the road. I've, I've, I've done some indoor stuff earlier in the year when I was coming back from injury and I, was, I wasn't I was allowed outside. But if, if I'm allowed outside, You're outside. Can, I'll, I'll always be outside. Yeah, ah, no, it's fair play. Is there any... Um, cycling, obviously, is great for um, sort of cardiovascular, burning burn lots of calories. What's what's the diet look like? Are you are you on quite a high calorie intake? If you're doing big yeah, mileage, yeah. Um, well, it's if you think about when I was cycling around the world, I, I was cycling about towards the end. I was cycling about two hundred miles each day. Wow. So that I was burning maybe like eight or nine thousand calories a day. <laughs> that's huge. So that's you know it's it's not even possible to eat that much in a day because it's just it's just so much. So you're always in a deficit, which is which is part of the challenge of ultra endurance because you're yeah. you're burning so much and you're not replacing it. But n- now that I'm you know now that I'm training for road racing, it's a wee bit different because I'm not you know the training's a lot more intense. It's mm. I'm not going out and riding for twelve hours anymore. It's more you know two and three hour sessions that are really intense. Yeah, it's more about more about speed and going fast rather than going for a longer period of time. So yeah, you know I may be burning sometimes in the biggest day you know, maybe two or 3,000 calories. So for, for me, it's just, I just track everything that I eat. And, you know, I'm just tracking the calories in, calories out. And yeah. The, the philosophy for me is I'm always eating real, natural, whole foods. Like I don't eat anything processed. I don't eat any crap. I don't eat any junk. And I'm, I'm just the sort of guy who's, I'm self-aware. Like I, I know that I know what works for me. I'm, I was never the, it's like one of the reasons why I don't drink anymore is because yeah. I was never the guy who could go to the pub and have two pints. Like yeah, I just, you get smashed. Yeah. I have, I have no interest in two pints of beer in the same way that I have no interest in two pieces of chocolate. Like yeah. if, I'm, if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm having chocolate, 
I want the whole fucking bar. Yeah. If I'm going to drink, then I need to go out four nights a week and I need to absolutely hammer it. That's just, that's the way I am. I'm, I'm an extreme all or nothing guy. So I just prefer my life with those all or nothing decisions where I just don't eat crap. I don't drink and I just focus on my cycling and that's it. That's uh, it, that's dead interesting. Um, any sort of dietary changes? I like vegan, vegetarian, Piscopalian, or what? Anything? Nah, t- to be honest with you, I actually tried the whole vegan, vegetarian thing a couple of years ago because I was, you know, I was interested in it. You know, it's you know, it's good for the environment. It's good for animals. But yeah, just to be real, to be real honest, uh, I I feel so much better when I eat meat than when I don't. It's just. Yeah, it's just, fair play. It's just, it's just how it works for me. So uh, I don't eat that much. I usually just have some chicken at night, my dinner, yeah. have, have eggs. But it's just a lot of vegetables, a lot of fruit, nuts, stuff like that. Yeah, just basically I just I just try and eat single ingredient foods. Like that's it. Wow, fair play. Um, what what would you say you've lost weight-wise then from, from your heaviest to where you are or your peak at point? Uh, it's funny you asked that question today, actually, because literally <laughs> this morning I recorded my lowest ever weight. <laughs> wow! I'm I'm now I'm now 157 pounds, which is right. it's just just over 11 stone. Wow! And, and I'm I'm six foot as well, so yeah, that's it's, it's quite extreme because obviously if you understand that the path that I'm now on, like I'm trying to become a professional cyclist and I'm I'm going to be a climber, so getting my weight down as low as possible is, is so important. So that's, that's my plan at the moment. So Fair I'm, just, I'm about 71 kilos now. And that's I think really good at my heaviest. I was about, I think it was about 14 stone. So it's about three, three stone that I've lost in the last few years. Wow. And obviously uh, as a cyclist, you, you need to be, um, as light as possible, don't you? Um, yeah. For for the whole drag purpose and, and obviously extra extra pounds extra pounds you're you're taking with you, um, yeah it's it, it's dead interesting. Um, I've only ever known one other guy who was a pro cyclist, a guy called Joe Bingley, um, and he was a he was pretty much like like you, like he, he when it comes to sort of nutrition and, and and he was very very set on what he what he put in his in his in his mouth. Um, yeah, it's that, mate. Honestly, I I don't want to pay lip service to what you've achieved. I think we're going to have to have a part two to this, um, because I don't want to I don't want to brush over like big achievements, um, because I think it, you know you you're one of them sort of guys who've got so much in the locker that it would be wrong to just brush over them very very quickly. Um, but one thing I will ask you, um, where are you on um mind games? Uh, and I'm asked because I'm I play them on people, um. And the psychological mind game begins a lot of time on sort of social media now. Um, is that in cycling? Is that part of cycling culture? Yeah, big time. Yes, love it. I love it. <laughs> Go for it. Big, big time. I'm going to be the absolute master of mind games. <laughs> and one, of, one of the things that I've done in the last year, one of the things that I'm going to embrace massively over the next five years as I, as I go on the journey to winning the Tour de France. As you know, in oh, cycling, no. for anybody who doesn't know, the, the winner of the Tour de France gets a yellow jersey and whoever's, whoever's leading the Tour wears yellow all the time. Well, for the, for the last year, I've been wearing a yellow jersey in my training. and when I'm, and, It's actually weird for me to be in blue today. Yeah. and it's the, only, <laughs> the, only, the only reason that I am is because my, my, my prized yellow jersey actually got destroyed in america obviously got oh really so i don't actually have another one yet because the, the factories and stuff have all shut down but basically my one of my biggest strategies for winning the tour de france is that i'm going to be in yellow all the time and i'll give you i'll tell you a story to demonstrate why this is going to be powerful where i was i was basically wearing a yellow jersey all last year for the entire cycle around the world and there was one day where I didn't have it for some reason because it was in the wash or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was, wear- I was wearing this blue one. And somebody, somebody commented on my Facebook page. And this is, exactly the, 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 this is exactly what I was trying to achieve. And this is what happened. Somebody commented saying, it's weird not seeing you in yellow. <laughs> and that's, that is what I'm trying to create. And not, not just for people and fans and supporters. I want my opponents and my rivals to think like that as well, that 
Mm. It, I want them to just expect me to be in yellow. It, it's, it's dead interesting that you bring this up. Um, I, I believe a lot in psychology and um, how we can influence people. Uh, even people who are fitter than you, um, because maybe they're mentally weaker and, and they just don't want anything to do with you. Like they don't want to be, they don't want to feel like you're chasing them down. So like in a way they, they beat themselves. And I watched a, I watched like a, a, a running race where the guy who was second kept on saying every time he went to a checkpoint, oh, how far so-and-so ahead, how long is he ahead? And I was like, this is dead interesting because he's more focused on the guy who's first race than he's focused on his own race and how much energy is he putting into this guy? And at the end of the day, if you're thinking about somebody else, to think takes calories and it takes energy to think about someone else. So you're eating into their reserves, even if it's 1%, 2%, at the level that you're going to be working at, that is win and lose, isn't it? That's that, what you said about Chris Hoy, that split one hundredth of a second. And I think I, I can see him, man. You'd be like the Conor McGregor of cycling. You'd be coming in with a big uh, fur coat on, like <laughs> rolling through. Hey, what is, no, what is, you're, you're absolutely spot on, mate. I think that one of the things that I understand and I know about myself is I'm a good personality. You know, I'm... Yeah. I, I will be very interesting when I hit when I hit the pro world, and I think that you know I'm I'm just a massive believer in just being the best that I can be. I've I have no interest in any other athlete or any other competitor. I've no yeah. interest in talk, talking about any of them. I just going to be the best that I can be, and I think that if I can do that, then nobody will get close to me. Do you know what? I, and the thing is, Josh what you're doing is you're making people like me, people who don't watch cycling, right? I respect it as a, as a talent, but if, if, if there was like a guy like you and I'd be like, oh yeah, he's, he's a bit tasty. And I would, as someone who's not interested in cycling, it would make me watch it and go, oh yeah, here we go, here we go. He'll do, do you know what I mean? Like it gets, it gets people onto the, it gets fresh eyes onto the sport and then people go, well, actually, do you know what I mean? I actually think I might go and buy a road bike now. Like, it, it reinvigorates it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's all well and good being nice and friendly. And look, sportsmanship has its place. You have to learn to win well, but you have to learn to be gracious in defeat. Um, that's part of it. But, you know, I, I see it sometimes when, when we go and do, like, park runs and 10Ks. Like, if I know there's someone who's close, who's near me, I will say to them, you've been training? And they'd be like, yeah, why? Oh, I don't look like it. Just that, do you know what I mean? Just that little, little bit. And I think what you're doing there, I love it. You, you're in yellow all the time because that's, that's all I do. That's my mindset is yellow. So I ain't wearing no other colour fucking jersey because I'm not interested in it. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, Josh, look, again, I, we'll definitely have to have a part two of this. Uh, we're flying through it. Really interesting guy. Um, fucking hell. I'm going to go watch, buy, a, buy a bike, I think. Um, <laughs> get after you. Um, so we're going to start look at doing the, um, the little close down. Um, what does your day look like routine-wise? Uh, it really depends. Every, every day is different because my, it's, my training is different. So, for example, like what, what the strategy at the moment is we're transitioning from, you know, an ultra endurance rider to a road racer. So the yeah, yeah. very different. So when I was doing the ultra endurance stuff, I might go out and ride, you know, five or six hours every day. But now what we're doing is we're, we're training really heavy on some days and then really light on some days. So yeah. for some days I'll maybe go out and I'll cycle for three hours and it's really, really intense. But then the following day I've got a day off just to let the body rest and recover from that. So it really depends on what's happening with my cycling, but the best way to, to describe it is that everything in my life resolve, revolves around cycling. It's, um, it's just, it's the sun in my life. It's just, and everything else orbits it. It's just, that's it. And it just really, it's, it's just all about cycling. So, you know, on the days that I'm training, I'll be out on the bike for a few hours. And then the days that I'm not, I'm resting. And then every, everything cycling, either am I, am I either out in the bike training or I'm indoors, you know, watching stuff about cycling or reading stuff about cycling. I'm just, I'm just so single-minded. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, hey, nah, it's fair, fair play, mate. And uh, I was going to say, what workouts are you doing? Um, 
do you do anything away from cycling? Any sort of uh, core or uh, Pilates or yoga or anything like that? Nah, I've been thinking about for a while about starting to do some yoga just for you know flexibility. Yeah. And I'm just I'm going through this transition at the moment where I'm trying to under I'm I'm trying to understand and learn more about how fatigue impacts mm. the body. And so it's you know yeah. for me in the past I would I'd be away hammering the miles every day, and I'm now going through this transition where I really need to start understanding that you know rest is rest is really important so yoga is probably going to be something that will come into my routine very soon you know I'll be doing a lot more of that as I yeah. go on this path yeah fair play to you man uh, what have you started have you started anything new during won't be won't be Tiger King on Netflix by, the, by your schedule <laughs> <laughs> nah you know I've, there's not some, something that I've wanted to start for a while and I've been at toying with is I'm probably going to start learning French at some point. Yeah, I've not, well, I've not been doing it. I've not been see to be see to be really honest with you. Um, there's nothing really in my life aside from cycling, and as as yeah. I said that, and, and the reason why is that you know my training's so intense and heavy. Yeah. That, you know, it, the, the life the life of a like a full time athlete, which is what I am now. A lot of people don't see it as that. There's really aside from your training, you don't really do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're either you're either training or you're on the couch recovering. That's yeah. that's really it. There's there's not much over and above that, and that's something that I'm just trying to get used to at the moment because it's, it's it's all new to me. Because you know most of the time I've been away cycling, so it's been every day. But now that I'm I'm at this position where I'm transitioning to a new discipline of cycling, the rest and recovery is so important. So aside from sight, there's really not that much that I'm doing. Fair play, man. Um, was, what have you stopped? God, it doesn't sound like you do stop. <laughs> Coffee shops? What have I stopped? <laughs> Did you know one thing, one thing that I have stopped? I used to do a lot of... I used to, I used to walk a lot. Right, yeah. I used to, when, when I was back home living in Edinburgh, I used to walk everywhere, like sometimes 20 or 30,000 steps a day. Like I used Class. to really be into that. But at the moment, you know, the, the cycling is just so important that you know, I just, I, yeah. I need to make sure my legs are rested, that I'm not doing as much of that. But, you know, it's just, the, the, the journey of becoming who I'm going to become requires certain sacrifices. And I don't, I don't really see it as a sacrifice. I see it more as an investment. But, you know, I, there's certain things that you don't get to do. And that's, that's a choice that I make. And I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm totally happy with that. Yeah, no, fair play. Uh, what's the first thing you're going to do after lockdown? Get back to America. Finish this cycle. <laughs> man proper guy um josh look i'm really really impressed mate with with your outlook and the way you come across i think um i think you've already won the tour de france in your mind um no, just... do you know do you know what mate you're you're, you're, you're spot on <laughs> you're, you're spot on when you say that which is i have i have already won it which is yeah. <laughs> that doesn't mean that i'm not gonna have, there's no there's no hard work or it's not going to take sacrifice and suffering but yeah. the best way to think about it is that in my mind, I've, I've already won it. Like, I've yeah. already won it. And, you know, yeah. it's, you, you look at a guy like me who's, who's, you know, so determined. And bear in mind as well is that it takes, it takes balls and courage to share your goals so publicly okay, with nice. the world. Yeah. And especially when you look at how big my goal is, yeah. there's, real, there's real power and there's real momentum behind telling the world what you're going to do and then going and doing it. And yeah, it's I, really, I really appreciate the, the comment you made about Conor McGregor because he's, he's one of my heroes. He's one of my, if there's anybody I could, you know, look up to in life, he's, he's for me that, you know, he's, yeah, he's just such an ins inspiring guy to me. And I think that the power of intention and telling people what you're going to do, you know, and then repeatedly telling people over and over and over again, which is what I do. You're so spot on. I have already won that race, and it's just yeah. a matter, it's just a matter of time now before it happens. Uh, I'm gonna go and put um, twenty quid on you uh, right now. Um, so. you, know, you know, it's funny you say that. I've actually I've been trying to get a bookmaker to take bets in it. Well, if you do, <laughs> I'll have twenty on it. Fucking right, I will <laughs> because uh, you you have got the the winning mindset. Um, you have got that focus that that. that what sets people apart. Josh, where can people find you and where can people follow the journey? Yeah, so I'm documenting most of my journey on social media. You do video blogs on there, Josh Quigley92, Instagram, yeah. Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Yeah. 
Awesome. Um, Josh, it's been fantastic having you on. Um, I'm literally, I'm on, I'm on hills tonight. I'm on hill reps. Um, so instead of doing fucking six, I'm going to do eight. Two for you. Uh, <laughs> so you got to, you got to keep it moving. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's been Josh Quigley. Uh, you, you will see this guy winning fucking big cycling races. I'll tell you now. Um, that's just how it's going to be. Josh, mate, thanks very much for your time. Awesome talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers, mate.